of of listening to you speak uh, about intracoronary imaging. As you all know, uh, Akiko heads intracoronary imaging at, at Columbia University, but she's also head of the intracoronary imaging core lab at CRF. So Akiko, thank you for sharing with us how to practically use intravascular imaging in the cath lab. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. So today I'd like to talk that my, what I like is intravascular imaging, but I try to be very practical because there is a lot of things to discuss. So let's start. So this is what I think, what is a clinical question in the Kassara, which you'd like to answer based on the intravascular imaging. And the first question is, what is current diagnosis? Is this truly coronary artery disease or something else? And also you'd like to ask, if this region is significant or not? And then when you decide to treat, you ask, how should I optimize this PCI? And then um, sometimes it's very complex and especially the calcified region, how we should do more. And then finally, when you see the stent failure, this is very useful scenario, which intravascular imaging help you a lot. So those are the topics which we would like to talk today. But before moving to detail, I talk the super basic of the intervascular imaging interpretation. So this is a picture of the IVAS and OCT to show the basic morphology of the coronary atherosclerosis. And first, this is normal artery. And when you look into the normal artery by OCT, you can see the media as low intensity band such as here. And similarly by IBUS, you see the media as dark band like this. Inside of the media is intima. By OCT, if that is fibrotic, you see the hyper intensity such as here. And similar by IBUS. OCT can tell you where is adventitia is outside of hyper intensity outside of the media. But IBUS, we cannot differentiate where the adventitia and perivascular tissue, everything looks like white. Once you have more plaque, we call this is fibrotic plaque. And usually their appearance is very homogeneous and by IBUS could be lower intensity compared to the adventitia or similar. By OCT, they are very homogeneous hyperintensity tissue. And even OCT, many times we can see the media because fibrotic tissue didn't attenuate the OCT wave. The next one is lipidic plaque. And actually the appearance is quite similar between the IBAS and OCT. And the important appearance is attenuation of the signal. At the surface, you see the tissue, but suddenly you don't see, meaning dark area. That's meaning there is no ultrasound signal anymore because of the ultrasound signal attenuated based on the lipidic plaque. And exactly the same in the OCT. So the definition of the lipidic plaque by OCT is you don't see behind. And finally, that's calcified plaque and both IBAS and OCT is very sensitive for the calcified plaque and much better compared to the angio. By IBAS, you see the hyper intensity on the top and then you don't see anything behind. Similar to the lipidic plaque, oh, well, the mechanism is different. When you have the calcium, the ultrasound reflect everything and then cannot penetrate. That's how it looks like the IBUS picture. Therefore, the definition of the calcified plaque by IBUS, you should see the hyper intensity and behind, you don't see anything. This is so-called acoustic shadow. On the other hand, good thing of the OCT, you see the calcified plaque, typically low or high, it's very heterogeneous appearance but the importance is 
interface is very clear. So that's a very uh, clear calcium, which is uh, the definition of the OCT calcium. The good thing of the OCT compared to the IBAS, we can see the thickness of the calcium. Then we can evaluate the amount of the calcium more clear compared to the IBAS. So that's a super basic. Okay, let's start two important questions in the CAS lab. So this is a case which suffer, who suffered STEMI after the thrombectomy, you see some sort of the aneurysm appearance by angio. By OCT, you can see the nice plaque rupture. This is ruptured plaque, and this is the CDL fibrous cap. And you see the syncal fibrillar loma. This is lipidic plaque. And then this side, you see the red cells rhombus defined as um, tissue which having a big attenuation. But such very clear uh, thrombotic ruptured plaque I don't think you need OCT to diagnose. It's very clear, even angiographically. What is unclear is this type of the picture. So this is a different case, 58 years old male and smoker and presenting STEMI. And the operator thought that already is my culprit, but it's a little bit unclear. It's not thrombotic. It's not TIMI one or two. It's somehow intermediate region. So how we are be sure this is culprit of the current STEMI? This is OCT picture. In the region, I see the thrombus. Compared to the prior case, this is so-called platelet-rich thrombus. There is a tissue, but no attenuation. And amount is not too many, but I see here, I see here, and here. So by OCT, this is clearly thrombotic event. And underlined plaque compared to one before is not too much repeat. There is some attenuation, but if you go to proximal distal, you see behind, meaning this is already fibrotic plaque. So this is very typical picture, so-called plaque erosion. Without rupture, you have the thrombotic event. And in such, you may not be clear this is culprit region to diagnose. And then OCT is very helpful to understand where my culprit. Just to summarize, the plaque rupture occur in the very repeat rich plaque and disruption of the fibrous cap. Erosion is relatively repeat poor lesion. And then because of the deficiency of the endothelium causing the thrombotic event. The finally, I do think this is also very important underlined plaque causing the thrombotic event. This is a patient, 81 years old male, female, and a lot of uh, risk factor and presenting non STEMI. So, what do you think? When I see this picture, I saw this is very calcified region. Left coronary artery, I see already here. And right coronary artery, yes, this is a very tight region, but very calcified. And if you see this type of the very calcified region and a lot of risk factor and usually old patient, you have to think about this type of the underlined plaque. By OCD, it was diagnosed as calcified nodule. At the site of the region, I see the thrombus. Compared to the other picture, I see the very clear calcified plaque here and here and here up to here. But many times diagnosis of calcium nodule is a little bit unclear for the people who are not very familiar with the OCT picture. So how to diagnose? So this is a pathological picture of the calcified nodule was developed in the calcified plate and rupture of the fibrous cap. And because of the break of the calcified plate, you see a lot of small nodular calcification. So this is accumulation of small nodular calcification that we call the calcified nodule as a big uh, nodule. But when you look into the OCT, inside actually we see the small calcium here and here. It's defined as clear border and hypointensity, which is same what we defined as calcium. And you see the calcium plate behind. 
So those are the very typical picture of the calcified nodule, but calcified nodule contains a fibrin in between, and that's the reason you see the attenuation together. And in such, the region is very hard. It's not like regular STEMI underlined plaque. So even the patient with acute coronary syndrome, you have to be prepared what I should do in terms of the treatment. Could be more debulking device. We analyze about 900 patients. And if you include only the region which having the very severe calcium defined, maximum angle is more than 270, 43% of the underlying plaque is calcified nodule. So usually when we say the underlying plaque, calcified nodule is we call like 5%. But if you look into the very severe calcified region, the prevalence is not such small. So let's talk the next step. That's the how should I decide to treat or not. And this is also important topics in the case lab. And this is a summary in the past who did the correlation between the IBUS or OCT in terms of the smallest area compared to the FFR positive. The key message is accuracy is whatever you choose a cohort is always about 70%. The answer is, can I decide to treat or not based on the IBAS OCT? Answer is no, because accuracy is only 70%. So this is a four different study to compare the MLA by IBAS and FFR. If you look into the non-left main region, many of the region is here, meaning the lumen is small, but FFR is negative. Because epicardial artery, if you look into the distal artery or branch, they are small territory of the myocardium and many times look small, but actually it's not significant ischemia. However, the only exception in the left domain, this is a comparison between the lumen and FFR in the left domain cohort. And you see this area is quite few compared to non-left domain. The reason is because of the left domain, everybody having the big myocardial burden, and then your correlation should be much better compared to other. Left domain is very difficult place to diagnose by angio, and IBUS is very important. And this is a two different case, and which do you think is significant? The IBUS tell us, and left side, it's actually very severe. The MLA is 4.6. And the right side is we look into this way and then we overestimate in terms of the stenosis and the lumen is big enough. So whenever you are not very clear what my region is in the left domain, you have to do the IBAS. And what kind of cutoff should we use? This is probably the best data which we have by now. By comparing the IBAS in, in looking at the isolated left domain disease from South Korea, the correlation of the cutoff value was 4.5. And this is the data from the Europe. And they defer the left domain disease if the cut, uh, lumen area is larger than six square millimeter. And then they show the outcome is good. So for now, I think my recommendation, if you would decide the treat or not based on the IBAS lumen area, if you have more than six square millimeter, the far should be safe. So let's talk the next step, which is most important in terms of the stent optimization. So I'd like to show one very complex case but once you see the entire process, you understand how this type of the complex case looks simple. This is 81 years old male and non STEMI, a lot of risk factor, and EF is low, a lot of comorbidity. Therefore, a uh, decision was made to do the PCI. And geographically, you see the 111 region. And then the LED looks very tight. And then geographically, it's very difficult to decide in terms of the stent size and where to wear. 
So this is Iba's picture from the circumflex here to the left domain. And the measurement was distal one is 5.1 and the left domain is close to six. And because of the artery having the remodeling, because to compensate uh, the plaque accumulation to, uh, to compensate lumen compromise, they are bigger compared to the original size. Therefore, my recommendation to choose the stent size, whenever you see the size by lesser size by IBUS, you should round down to choose the smaller size compared to the IBUS. And because this is very huge circumflex, we decided for, and I see the cultural nodule in the bifurcation. So LR is more complex. And starting the very distal to the proximal, this is how it looks like the IBUS. One thing which you have to remember in terms of the LED is the LED is the most significant vessel having the vessel tapering. Where and when we can see the vessel tapering is when you have the big side branch. So starting the left domain to the distal left distal LED, the vessel size is quite different. Distal to the diagonal branch, media to media is 2.8. And middle before proximal to the diag, but distal to the circumflex is about 3.5 and 4. And prox very proximal to the uh, LED is similar to the circumflex, close to 5. And we have to decide what stent size based on the distal. And because we really wanted to make it as large as possible, a little bit over, uh, oversized, but we decided putting the 275 for the LED. And then this is how it looks like the final outcome. This style 275 and proximal 35 and circumflex 4. And then pot was done based on the 5, based on the IVAS measurement and the KBT was performed. After you finish this type of the strategy, you really have to confirm everywhere looks good. Especially the long region, you may miss the under expansion. In this case, the LED starting the very distal, we see the nice expansion and 4.7 square millimeter. And compared to the distal, it's more than uh, distal room area and we thought big enough. And then proximal mid LED is also good stent expansion. And going to the circumflex, also see the good stent expansion. So this is a process to decide where to wear and which size and confirm how good in terms of the stent expansion. Process is actually quite simple. You have the guide, you have the region, and you have the stent. And where you have to focus is really in the stent and edge and proximal portion. Many times we see something happen in between. So let's go through one by one. So in terms of the stent, this is quite old data, but as of now, this is still really true. Whenever you have the stent, outcome is really related how big the stent area and how long the stent. If you have smaller stent area, you have poor outcome. And if you have a really long region, you have more chance of the poor outcome. And if you have both, you have poor outcome. So those are the very simple concept, but still true, that bigger is better. And this is also very important paper. And, and we uh, did the comparison between the stent area, which measured by IBAS right after the direct stenting, compared to the predicted stent area by calculating the compliance chart. Meaning if you have three millimeter stent, your expected stent area is seven square millimeter. And then we analyze stent area right after the stenting by IBAS. This is how it looks like the result. The average stent expansion is 4.6 square millimeter, meaning 66%. Meaning 
whenever you put a stent in the coronary artery, coronary artery having a lot of plaque and long, it's not like opening the stent into the air. Therefore, you have to expect your stent is underexpanded than you expect. So average is about 70%. This is the reality. And we did same study using the uh, current generation and we see the exact same result. On the other hand, people look into the optimal cutoff and those are the data to predict who is more likely to having the listenosis versus not. This kind of cutoff is minimum achievement of the minimum stent area. This is not optimal stent area. Using the first generation or second generation or recent generation, usually non left main epicardial artery, minimum requirement of the absolute stent area is about 5 to 5.5. But importantly, all of the data telling us if you have large stent area, you have more probability not having the listenosis. Therefore, still large is better. But we have to be practical. We cannot get like 12 square millimeter in the epicardial artery. Therefore, if you go to the small artery, you have to compare to the distal reference. And they are at least similar to the distal reference or at least 90% compared to the distal reference. The second question was, what should I found in terms of the edge after we see the haziness by Angel? So this is a very simple question, which was answered long time ago. They picking up so-called angiographic haziness after the stenting at the edge, and then do the IBUS and what was found. About half is you miss the region meaning there is a plaque which was not covered by stent and about half you see the edge dissection. And I thought this is quite true. When I see the region and then I see the headness, most of the time I see either one of the answer. And usually nothing is very rare. And the question was, how should I cover the edge? Where should I land? And those questions was answered by IBUS. This is including the second generation DS and what is a plaque burden which we should achieve to avoid listenosis at the edge. And cutoff value is around 50 to 55%. So therefore our recommendation to cover or stop or choose as a landing zone is about 50% of the plaque burden. And other important topics is stent edge dissection. So this is a different type of the edge dissection. Usually we define based on the depth of the dissection because that's how separate of the outcome. Tiny intimal dissection where you flap into the media or you see the hematoma or there is something outside of the media which we call the extra media hematoma. The many times the question come, when should I put additional stent? And based on our previous data, including the horizon or the DS, including more than 3000 patients, we found if the edge dissection is more than 60, uh, 60 degree of the flap or length is longer than three millimeter, or if your residual lumen is less than five square millimeter, more likely that's causing the stenosis or acute event. Therefore, the recommendation to put additional stent. But those are, we should ask again, using the OCT or using the current generation, which we are undergoing. This is very clear stent position. And this is a distal and this is a proximal. And many times malabortion occur at the proximal edge. The reason was because you choose the stent size based on the distal size. And then most discrepancy between the stent and the vessel occur at the proximal edge. 
And this type of the big malapportion should be treated because when you leave it alone, your wire next time could be behind stand. But should we treat any type of the malapportion? Answer is not. As long as you have enough stent area, we really don't see the difference in terms of the outcome with without acute malapposition. So truly important is how good expansion of the stent and accept the big malapposition at the proximal edge, which you may causing the future issue in terms of the wiring. Uh, malapposition in the middle it really doesn't connect to the poor outcome. The last thing is so-called stent deformation. This is actually many times happen at the ostium of the left main or ostium of the right coronary artery because your guide is pushing to the stent. So this case, there is only one stent implanted from the circumflex to left main, but at the end of the procedure, we see the multiple layer of the strut at the left domain. This is so-called stent deformation. So what's happening is this portion of the stent was pushed and deformed and longitudinally shortened compared to the original length. The issue is two things. One is because you deform, your final stent area is smaller compared to before. And the second, because your stent is shorter compared to the original, and then you may miss the osteo region. This one recognition is most important because many times this is recognized at the end of the procedure and without guide out, you may not recognize. So it is important for the recognition. And in the actual trial, it was found 6.5% and majority was in the osteum. And if the patient having the stent deformation, they have poor outcome, and especially have poor outcome happen in the early stage, this is true even adjusted in the other factors such as minimum stent area. One more thing I would emphasize. This is a case, 77 years old female, and you see the osteostenosis in the right coronary artery. And this is I was pulled back. This time is normal, and you see the stenosis at the ostium. It's very short and looks like calcified. Those are the very difficult region to treat. To summarize, it's very short, and this is already guide, and calcified and negative remodeling. And this type portion was not much disease. And what's happening? After the stenting, this is IBIS. And I recognize stent was implanted normal segment and lesion was not covered. And I see the exact same lesion at the ostium. And those are the important because angiographically, it's very hard to recognize this happen. And if you don't do the IBIS, or if you don't do the IBIS correctly after disengage of the guide, you may miss this. So this case we recognize, still the region was there and the additional stent was implanted and finally it was really good stent expansion. So whenever you have the osteo region, at the end of the procedure, you really have to disengage the guide to confirm that was really well covered or even the region was not ostium you, didn't, you don't have any deformation at the ostium, which is very important at the end. Okay, so let's talk a little bit for the calcium, which is the most difficult scenario of the PCI. So this is a case in the second flex, a very tight region, and we see the 360 degree of the calcium. Or I would say this could be dense fibrous plaque. And then I was asked to review the IVAS after stenting and I'm almost like having the chest pain. And this is after the stenting, you see the stent inside of the calcified. It's almost no expansion at all. 
and you see the dog bone shape. This we really have to avoid. Um, so the prediction is quite important. So let's start in terms of the recognition of the calcified region. So this is a comparison between the IBAS versus angio or OCT versus angio. So we put the IBAS or OCT defined maximum calcium arc. And yellow is angiographically severe calcium and blue is moderate calcium and red is no calcium. Whenever you see the calcium by angio, you should see more calcium by IBAS or OCT. So they are correlate very much. That's very true. The one more important thing is, look at here. So you have the big calcium by IBAS or OCT, but angio, you see no calcium. What is this? That's a big question. So this is the answer. This case, I don't see any calcium by angio. And IBAS, there is a big calcium. It's almost 270 degree. And this is same case by IBAS and OCT. OCT is, looks quite different compared to the IBAS. Yes, there is a calcium, but you see this calcium is such thin. Calcium here to here and calcium here to here, which exactly same location compared to the IBAS, but this calcium is quite thin. So whenever you see this type of the very thin calcium, total amount of the calcium is little compared to the visible calcium by angio. Therefore, you couldn't see by angio. So to answer that question directly, we pick up the region and geographically visible calcium versus no visible. And all of the region having IBAS more than 180 degree of the calcium. And then we compare the calcium characteristic by OCT. The thickness, thicker than 0.5 millimeter thickness is much more angiographic visible calcium, but it's very little angiographic non-visible calcium. Therefore, the minimum stent area is much larger in angio non-visible calcium. Therefore, in my understanding, angio is actually not too bad to diagnose calcium to start with. So whenever you don't see any calcium, any location by angio, even you see the calcium by IBAS, probably they are seeing calcium. And then there should be good expansion. But you start seeing the calcium by angio, you should expect that very thick, big calcium. So that's one message. But once you start seeing the calcium, you have to dig into more. How should I do more? And then to answer that question, we develop so-called calcium score. And the importance of the prediction of the stent expansion is not arc. It's not yes or no, it's really total volume of the calcium. So the angle is important and thickness is important and length is important. All of these are independently correlate with poor stent expansion. Based on this, we develop the score if the angle is larger than 180, thickness is thicker than 0.5 or length is more than five, we consider the calcium is more. And based on the score, we see more poor expansion if we have the higher score. Whenever you see OCT in the calcium region, you see the thick, large, long calcium, we have to consider something more. And we develop same similar score by IBAS. Because we learn a lot, based on the OCT score, we start more advanced way. And we know smaller calcium is not important. So we start with the calcium is more than 270 degree only, which always, most of the time, and geographically visible calcium. And then we ask what additionally IBAS can tell us. And compared to the OCT, the good thing of the IBAS, we can see the vessel area, vessel size, even at the site of the calcium. If you look into the maximum calcium, you couldn't see the vessel, but 
if you move a little bit, you should see the vessel size. And the vessel is larger than 3.5 is important. And nodular calcium is very important because this is a marker of the big calcium. And circumferential calcium is very important. This is not just large calcium. You have to break to expand the stent, which is quite different compared to uh, this type of the calcium. And then total length of the calcium, more than 270 degree. And based on the IBUS, including only severe calcified region, if any of them is yes, we put to the point one. And based on the IBUS calcium score, we see the very similar findings. If we have the more calcium score, we have poor expansion. But the importance, we pull out a telectomy region. And compared to without a telectomy, the curve is looks different. Even the big uh, high calcium score after the telectomy, you are better stent expansion. Because of the telectomy or uh, rhizotripsy, making the fracture and then changing the stent expansion. Okay, so using the last uh, five, 10 minutes, let's talk in the final topics, which is stent failure. This is a case by Dr. Shirohmitz, who is working in the St. Francis Hospital. And this is pre-intervention and severe lesion. And pre-dilatation, we see the dog bone. And this patient having the recurrent instant stenosis. And this is actually at the time of the stent implant, at the time of the instant stenosis treatment. And he thought I really couldn't open the artery. So what is the reason of this instant stenosis? And then he did OCT. This is answer. So you see the old stent, it's very underexpanded. The minimum stent area is only three square millimeter. And this is a calcified plaque, which we discuss. And calcified plaque behind the stent is 360 degree. That was the reason of the under expansion in the from the beginning. And you see the really napkin ring region in the region. That's really this picture. So this case, he did laser. And after laser, the OCT show no change. But after laser and modifying the region, and after the high pressure balloon, we see the nice calcium fracture behind stent. And then finally, the stent lumen area is finally larger. So if you see this type of the reason of the instant stenosis, you have the different way to decide to treatment. So this is totally different scenario. And this is 50 years old male and patient having the stable angina. Patient had cipher stent a long time ago. And cipher stent is here. And you see kind of isolated region and what's happening. And this case, OCT was performed. And this is nice plaque rupture. And actually this is in the stent. I see the stent slot is here. And this is definitely in the stent. And in the stent, you see the nice repeated plaque. And this is syncapabulateroma, and then plaque rupture. So this so-called neoatherosclerosis. So stent was implanted a long time ago. And then atherosclerosis developed again, and then causing the plaque rupture. So even in the stent, you see this type of the lesion. So we have to treat, this is like the noble atherosclerotic region. So this is a summary, including OCT defined instant stenosis. And if the region, if the patient coming back within one year from the stent implantation, we see the majority is due to the under expansion. But if the patient coming back more than one year, the dominance is more likely neointima hyperplasia. And if this is more than two years, actually, this is more likely neoatherosclerosis. And OCT is better in terms of the evaluation of the instant stenosis. And you see different type of the picture. 
Those are so-called neoatherosclerosis. Inside of the stand, you see the lipidic plaque, and you see the plaque rupture, and you see the thrombus. And even you see the calcified nodule. You remember this is calcified nodule now developed in the stent. You see the small calcium here. That's the reason we diagnose this is calcified nodule. Or this is most difficult type of the region. You see the calcium and all the stent is almost floating in the calcified plaque. Or uh, you see the very um, homogeneous uh, fibrotic tissue or so-called evagination, evagination, meaning the, some kind of the reaction of the stent. Actually, the vessel is positively modeling and you may see the cavity. Or it could be the under expansion. So whenever you see the stent failure, you start thinking what is the cause of this stent failure? Is due to the under expansion? or due to the neoatherosclerosis, or due to the neointimal hyperplasia. This is a summary including about 400 instantly stenotic region, starting very early stage up to more than five years after the implantation of the second generation DS. And the prevalence of the neoatherosclerosis, including more than five years cases, is actually about 50%. And the majority is calcified neoatherosclerosis, such as this. So whenever you see the instant old lesion, which having the tight stenosis, and if the stent is very old, before starting treatment, you really have to look into what's happening inside, because the prevalence of the calcified neoatherosclerosis is really not rare. And then we ask ourselves, what is the prediction of the new stent expansion if you treat neointimal calcified region in the old stent? Answer is quite similar compared to the de novo region. If you have the sick calcium or if you have the large calcium in the stent, that's indicating poor stent expansion. So let's summarize uh, what we discussed today. And OCT is useful to clarify what is the ACS calibrated region. So ideally remind you in your mind, you should consider the plaque erosion or calcified nodule. And IBUS OCT cannot to be used to decide ischemia, but left main can be used complementary to the physiology. And stent sizing, when you use IBUS, round down at least 0.5 and then cover the plaque, less than 50%. And stent edge dissection is important if that is large and small lumen area, consider the additional stent. And angiographic visible calcium indicating such as thick and large calcium. And whether you do more additional treatment, just imagine how big the calcium volume. You have to evaluate three-dimensionally, arc, thick, and length. And IBUS OCT must be used to understand what's the cause of the stent failure. That's derived to you the correct treatment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Akiko. That was, that was really fantastic. Uh, and like you promised, uh, very practical. Um, lots of practical tips that we can use in the cath lab every day. Um, and very comprehensive. So I'm going to pass you on. You know, we want to improve with um, intracoronary imaging here in Monty. So in order to do that, we got our own Japanese team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to pass you on to Shunsuke and Yuhei, who will do the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shun and, and Yuhei. Thank you for a great lecture. Um, I have a question on my own before um, questions pop up in the chat. Um, so as you know, in Japan, we use IBIS all the time, like 90% or more uh, pre and post uh, PCI. And here at Monty, fortunately, we use a lot of imaging. We use almost like 70% IBIS and OCT either or. We, we use uh, quite a bit of imaging. 
but I saw this shocking uh, data from 2 million Medicare uh, patients from Jack Intervention that showed IVIS use was only like 5.6% across the nation. Um, I was just one, wondering what your take on that, why the uh, imaging is so low and uh, how we could increase the uptake of imaging. Yeah, I think that there is multiple reason, but I think the most um, critical reason which we couldn't use a lot in the United States or outside of the Japan is really cost issue. Japan, we can use IBAS, even diagnostic and insurance cover. So I think we really have to pay enough when we use uh, intravascular imaging because that helps us a lot. So to make it happen, we really have the super robust data to move the class one criteria. That's we are really working hard in the Illuminium 4 mm -hmm. uh, to make the very robust evidence. And then uh, we should pay more for the intravascular imaging. That's number one. But second is really education or understanding. And many people uh, misunderstand IBAS or OCT taking more time and that's not true. When you see the entire picture and understand everything before decision, you see everything and then you understand what you are step by step. So actually, if you are very good user, IBAS or OCT can reduce your procedure time. So I think the young people like you uh, understand how practical and make it easier for entire PCI. And I really recommend for the young generation to use the intravascular imaging when you have the question, why my stent didn't go? Why I have the acute occlusion of this patient? And why this patient having the dystenosis? Whenever you have the question, which you couldn't answer by angel, always intravascular imaging tell you what was wrong. And then answer that question each time, your skill of the intervention grow up more and more quicker and help you to diagnose even geographically. So I think really education and your motivation to use the intravascular imaging. I hope answer. <laughs> so Akiko, um, what's the level of the percentage of intracoronary imaging at Columbia? I think uh, it depends on food, but I think close to 70%. Yeah. Okay. So we're not doing too bad at Monty. <laughs> we're, 60, we're 60 to 70%. We, right. we, try, we try to be better than Columbia, obviously. So we're going to get to 80%. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> Go ahead, sorry. So a uh, question from Dr. Menegis of our attending. Um, so in left main uh, IVIS uh, sizing, um, has anyone corrected the uh, um, left main size with the uh, um, body surface area or BMI as you know, body size of 100 pounds, which is different than 200 pounds? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, by now, nobody did correctly. So actually we are almost final stage to answer that question, we uh, picking up almost like 3,000 cases from Colombia and we analyze everything between the angio and the IBAS and we collect more than five years up to 10 years outcome. So we really have to answer that question, meaning the current criteria for left is really based on the absolute area, etc., which is not correct. We have to adjust based on the body surface area. So we Try to answer that question by ACC, I'd say. <laughs> is the study from Dr. Park the, in Asian population, the 4.5 cutoff, is that somewhat due to body size of Asian? Yeah, I, I really think so, yeah. They're like us, meaning the relatively small compared to the Caucasian people. Right, yeah. right. sounds good. Um, another question from the chat. Um, do you think pre-procedure cardiac CT could take over some of the function of IVIS or OCT for procedure guidance? I think so. I, I do think so. I mean, in terms of the plaque distribution, it's not because uh, the resolution is not enough where to, where to treat, but at least the calcium is actually CT is quite accurate. 
or could be even more accurate than Ibis, because also CT can see the thickness of the calcium, although the blooming artifact is overestimating. So I think also we did some study correlating the CT versus OCT, and then the amount of the calcium score by CT is quite correlated to the OCT defined calcium. So whenever you see the very high calcium score, automatically you are looking at the big calcium, even you do the OCT or IBAS. So I think the recognition of the amount of calcium, yes, but those are the more likely, uh, it's difficult to diagnose by CT. Um, but I do think always the um, technology is improving. So I think ultimately we should have the better idea where to wear or what kind of modality is going to be used based on the OCT, including CTFFR, to make the good plan before PCI. And then we can adjust what we see in the casual, I guess. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, I have a question of my own. Um, I've seen um, some different attending, uh, doing different things. Um, I, I'm used to pre and post uh, imaging for if we were going to image. Um, I've seen some people do just post, uh, just pre. Um, is one, if you were to choose one, would you say one is more important than the other? Uh... If I was asked which is more important, to be honest, I think play is more important. The reason was you have the better idea of what's happening, meaning you can choose post stent, even the mid LED sometimes, and you understand what you should do in terms of the debulking or modification of the region. And should we cover from where to where? So you can answer everything, and you have very clear idea what you should do. And then once you decide what you should do, it's actually you do, uh, do correctly. And of course, post is very important to understand good stent expansion and uh, the CDO disease or edge dissection. And that's quite important. Uh, and of course, do both is better. But if I really choose, actually put is more important because you have better plan everything. And if you have the good skill, Actually, uh, post is almost predictable. And that's a very <laughs> high, uh, good imaging PCI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But of course, you should do both. And play is very um, good information. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. So, Akiko, do you think, you know, for the fellows who are learning and um, wanting to get better at doing PCI, they have to get better at imaging? they should concentrate on one modality, OCT only, or do you think they need both modalities uh, to be a good interventionist? I think it depends, meaning some hospital cannot both, and your preference or preference your both, that <laughs> affects everything. And my uh, rec uh, recommendation, whatever you are comfortable. If you are comfortable to do one, just do one, that's fine. If you prefer to do both, it's fine. And my experience, if you start looking both, actually you are better and better because there is slightly different. Like when you start looking at the calcium, I think OCT is better. When you look into the left domain PCI, I think IBUS is definitely better. When you look at the CTO, it's definitely IBUS. So there is a good or bad in terms, not bad, um, some one is better than the other. So that's, I think, you may choose. Um, but I think even one modality, if you're used to use, I think just go ahead to keep using. That's fine. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Maher. Ready to this, uh, this question. Now we are involved in the Konavi IVAS OCT combined cap. Uh, what do you think about like, you know, future implication of these modalities? Do you think you know, that going to take off and we're going to use for the old cases or just the like, limited num you know, applications? How do you think like, you know, in the future of the imaging guided intervention? Uh, I think the combined Konavi catheter is good because whenever they are like all pullback simultaneously, so when you finish the pullback, you see the same uh, same slice by IBAS on the seats or sit side by side without any additional work. It's really, once you start looking at that picture, you learn a lot. 
meaning I thought this is calcium, but actually not by looking the uh, balls, right? So I think whatever you have more information, you understand better and helpful. And surface you see by IBUS, and vessel you see by IBUS. Uh, surface you see by OCT, and vessel you see by IBUS. So whenever you see both, you learn more. That's, I think, better. It's necessary. Uh, it's not always, but if the cost allow, I think we can go better modality. That's also fine. But I think that in the future, should we go where? I think, I think the answer is quite similar. Whatever you are comfortable, just choose one. I think that's okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I have one more question, if I may. <clears throat> um, so when you have multiple discrete uh, lesion and you mm. stent, um, I know you can't use, you don't use MLA as a cutoff, uh, but say you have, say, three multiple discrete lesion, is there mm -hmm. an, MLA rough number that you look at is like, if it's less than two, would you cover that region? Is there any guidance on that? Yeah, okay. I think, uh, yeah, by OCT, uh, no, but let's start from IBUS. In the first try, which was done by Dr. Waxman, the best cutoff was three square millimeter by, OC, by IBUS. So, of, and by, OC, by OCT, I'd say 2.5 because their lumen is about 0 0.5 square difference. If you have, if you want to have the, some rough number to consider, but if you go to the distal LED is always like three. So it's not just like the absolute number, but that's kind of the good uh, difference which you should consider. And one more important thing is OCT or IBUS lumen area is bad to predict ischemia, but good to predict non-ischemia. So negative predictive value is actually high. So whenever you see the larger than four, I think less likely having the ischemia. So those are the like the difference which we should consider. You don't have to do every <laughs> place to do the FFR, or it's actually difficult to decide in tandem region. Thank you. UA, any final comments? Oh uh, yes, yeah, so um, so I actually have one more question, like you know, and then probably that is again like about the future of our field. Is now we are starting fusion study, which is you know physiology assessment using the OCT, you know, three D reconstructed OCT imaging, and I feel like you know that eliminates a cumbersome of you know, in the cath level, like measuring FFR and then bringing the OCT or IVAS to, you know, guide the PCI. And then um, do you think this is just, you know, OCT thing or we can do with the IVAS or like, you know, FFR, angio, QFR combined with IVAS OCT is the way to go? How you, how you, you know, see the future of the, like, you know, precise uh, PCI? I think all of these, what you mentioned, is coming. And OCT derived virtual FFR should be real. And conceptually, IBUS can do. And actually, it was already presented based on the IBUS. We should expect what the virtual FFR. And the good thing of those imaging based on the virtual physiology is really we can define exact physiology impact per region without interaction. So actually some of them is good thing compared to the actual FFR. And it's going to be all together. And then we should be more uh, practical, meaning if the prediction is good enough, we may not need the physiology and we can more region level assessment. And of course, QFR help and if it's really not significant by QFR, it's really significant by QFR, uh, we can eliminate physiology to do. So all together, we should be more reasonable uh, to avoid unnecessary additional imaging or um, physiology. And I think everything is going to be become true. Yes. Good, good. Yeah, very excited. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there was one last question just came up from Hassan Jilawi. Maybe just that last question and then we'll stop. 
Uh, so last question, uh, do you have any idea of the cross-sectional area correlates <clears throat> on the CTA with the OCT IBIS um, areas? Um, so correlation? Correlation between the CTA um, measurement with yeah. coronary imaging. Uh, I think there is a multiple study which compare the both, but remember the CT is overestimating the diameter stenosis, meaning by CT, you see this is 70% diameter stenosis. Many times when you open the angio, it's 50%. So compared to the CT, IBUS is, uh, let's say same region by CT, if we measure like four, IBUS should be a little bit large. That's I think in general. Um, but I think to diagnose severe region, I think we are not talking three bus four, we are really looking for the significant or not. In such, those are going to the same direction, of course. Yeah. Great. Um, Shun and Yue, thank you so much. Akiko, that was fabulous. It was really an excellent learning experience. Uh, we all enjoyed it and learned tremendously from you again. Thank you for taking your time out and giving us an hour of your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so uh, enjoy much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank Look you. Look forward to seeing you in person. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Thanks for your time. Thank you.